The school in Little Nightmares 2 is just as dark and creepy as the rest of the game. However, I think if you scratch just a little bit below the surface, there are a bunch of clues as to what happened here before the events of the second game. If you haven't already played the first and second game and the DLC of the first game, I highly recommend you go and play those first as we are going to be spoiling both of them in this video. If you've already played the games or if you're not bothered about spoilers, I'm going to explain exactly what I think happened in the school before Mono and Six arrived. Obviously, they are only theories. Basically, nothing in these games is absolutely confirmed. Everything is open to interpretation. And this is just my interpretation of the clues that we are being given if you look just a little bit more closely at the environment. If you have a different theory or if you agree with my theory, let me know down in the comments below and we can have a discussion. I absolutely adore Little Nightmares theories. So moving on, I think that we can see clearly here what happened in the school before Mono and Six arrived. Before I talk about my theory, I have to establish a couple of things. First of all, I do think that the school used to be a normal school for normal humans, and I have a number of reasons why I think that. If we look at the current occupants of the school, there is the creepy teacher who is clearly monstrous. She has the inhuman ability to twist and bend her neck and stretch it for a long, long time. And she also never ever blinks. Now, I do think that this is the teacher having the ability to always keep an eye on the children. And we'll come into that maybe in another video. But also the children are made out of porcelain. They are clearly not normal human children. And we know that there are normal human children in the world. Well, there's human children anyway. We know that that there are Mono and Six, we know that there's the Runaway Kid, we know that there's the, a number of children on the moor, so there are absolutely children in this world. There's also a dead one in the first chapter of the game that we'll come back to later. So we've established that there were or are children in this world, so then the porcelain children are not normal. I think that this school used to have normal human teachers and human pupils. Now, if you look at the objects in the school, there are a bunch of things that the porcelain children don't seem to want nor need. For example, there are shoes and clothes that seem to be too big for them. There are backpacks and school bags that they don't seem to bother with that clearly hold some sort of belongings. And also the big one that I think proves this to be true is the kitchens. Now, if you go to the kitchens, you can see that it is clearly capable of producing food and there is still food left around. And yet none of the porcelain children seem to want nor need the food. They play with the food, they mess with the food, they even at one point it looks like they pee in the food, but not at one point do we see any of the porcelain children eat the food. Now we know that in the first game it was all about food. It was a key integral part of the first game and yet these kids don't seem to be interested in the slightest of eating and that does make sense. They're made out of porcelain. They probably don't need to eat. So if they don't need to eat, why do we have a fully functioning kitchen? And again, I think this is because they used to be normal human children that used to attend this school. And one of those children, I think, was six. Now, this isn't just a random theory. I have evidence to support this one as well. And let's go through that right now. So first of all, if you look at these photographs, there are a number of photographs or picture frames in the school environment. Most of them depict the porcelain children. However, one of them does show what appears to be normal human children. They look very, very similar to the porcelain children. And we'll come back to that later. But there are also two pictures, one of a boy and a girl. Now, the girl does bear a very strong resemblance to six without her raincoat. Now it might not be six, but I do think there are other reasons to support why this absolutely is six. And the second of those reasons is this room right here. Now at first glance on our first playthrough, you probably didn't really pay that much attention to this room, but I think there are a number of clues in here. The first one, if we look at the chair, somebody was clearly tied to this chair in this room. Now, if you look at the wall behind, it's clear that somebody was marking days. And I think this was probably the amount of days that they were stuck in this room for. Now, who else does that when they are trapped? That's right, Six. Six was marking the days at the beginning of the game. Now, we don't know if this is how many days she was trapped or how many days that she was choosing to stay there. We don't really know, but she was clearly marking the days of something. And I do think it's the amount of time she spent in both of these rooms. Now, you might think that it was the porcelain children that were counting on the wall with this chalk, but if you actually look at what the children do write and do draw in the game, they never want to do this. They always seem to draw the eye or the signal tower. In fact, there are a number of examples of porcelain children having access to chalk, and yet they never ever seem to count. They always draw one of those two things. Now, if you think about that logically, six if she was here at one point, she very easily could have escaped and made her way to the island before she was captured by the hunter. 
Now, if you look at the way that we got in the school, the way that we got in the school was by climbing down this bed sheets that have been tied together. It's a, an obvious escape mechanism, right? And it's one that we've seen before. We saw this in the first game. The girl, the runaway girl, she managed to do the same thing. And that's how Six managed to climb up in the first game as well. So it's clear somebody has already escaped the school before the events of the first game. And I do think that that was Six and maybe some other people. So those are the first parts of my theory. The school used to be normal, something happened and it became abnormal, and Six also used to study here before she left. Now, to continue this theory, I think this explains why Six is partially so aggressive. Now, if you look at this scene, if you choose not to kill this porcelain child, Six will creep up and will attack it. But she won't just attack the child, she does it in a very feral way. She jumps on top, she acts very similar to the porcelain children, and she does this kill animation which kind of shocks Mono. Even further to this, if you look at one of the lockers in the game, one of the lockers that has one of the static children in, there are two rats that are hung up by their tails inside the locker. Now, this could just be a callback to the first game. We remember that Six ate the rat, it was a big part of the first game, but it also could explain so much about this game. Now, spoiler, massive spoiler for the ending of the second game. There is a big theory that this is actually a prequel to Little Nightmares 1, and if you look at the secret ending, that kind of supports the idea that this is a prequel. Now, my theory here is that Six managed to escape this place, which means that at one point she was trapped. We know that Six is human and she needs to eat food. Is it outside of the realms of possibility that while Six was trapped here, she had to do some horrible things in order to survive? That would absolutely set up parts of this game and Little Nightmares 1. For example, if she was surviving on whatever food she could find, maybe even rats, that would explain why she doesn't seem that phased by the idea of eating a rat in Little Nightmares 1. She's already done it before, right? And on top of that, the idea that she's had to survive in this school with these bully children being incredibly aggressive and not particularly quite nice, that would explain why she's so scrappy in this game. She's had to survive. And anyone knows that people that have to survive in incredibly harsh environments often turn out to be a little bit aggressive. One other piece of evidence that kind of supports the idea that there used to be human children in this school is the number of fires that you can see burning around the place. Now, there's a couple of fires in these little barrels and there's also a pile of books that are burning. Now, it could just be that these people are burning things because they're naughty or burning the books because they want to get rid of some evidence or something. But I also kind of think that it points to the idea that somebody here was trying to keep warm. If you look at the game, it definitely appears to be set in winter. The place looks very cold and Six also has a cough throughout the entire game. If you leave her alone in some of the outside environments, she definitely has a cough, which is probably the fact that she's been running around outside in the rain without a raincoat, but it's not outside the realms of possibility that Six used these fires to keep herself warm while she was spending time at the school. So, second part of the theory, Six had help escaping. This is the coolest part of the theory in my honest opinion. If you look at this chess puzzle room, there is so much on offer here. If you poke around and look at what's on display here, I think this is one of the biggest secrets in the game. Now, if you look at this room at first glance, it just seems like a chess puzzle that we have to complete. And in the middle of this chess puzzle on the Black King, there is a porcelain doll tied to it with a crown strapped to his head. Now, if you look very, very closely at this porcelain child, I don't think this is a porcelain child at all. I think this is a human. I have a lot of evidence for this one and it gets very, very creepy, I'll tell you that now. But if you actually look at this room, this appears to be just a puzzle, right? And on the wall here, there is the solution to the puzzle. But if you look a little bit more closely, you can actually see that this black king is in checkmate. This is how you win chess. You position your pieces so that the other piece cannot move anywhere. It has no escape. Now, the reason why I think this is a human and not a porcelain child is very simple. This is the only child in the entire school that has its eyes closed. Now, if you look at the porcelain children and the teacher, they never once close their eyes. Now, if you look at the porcelain children, it kind of makes sense. They're made out of porcelain. I don't even think they have real working eyelids. Now, they can move and they can fight and they can do all of these things, but they never, ever blink. And in fact, the porcelain child that you kill and take his head so that you can sneak past all the others, if you look at him, his eyes haven't closed either. So when they die, they don't close their eyes. So look at this one again. 
then why has this one closed its eyes when none of the others do? Perhaps because this one was the human boy that all of the other porcelain dolls were modeled after. If you look at all of the porcelain children, there's only a few of them and they all look very, very similar. It's almost like they've been sculpted after something, maybe like a blueprint. Now, my theory here is that all of the porcelain dolls were sculpted after normal human children. Again, go back to the picture that we looked at earlier. This picture looks very different to the porcelain children. It looks similar but much more human-like. Is it possible that these were the original children that these porcelain dolls were modeled after? I think so. And I think that this little boy that we see tied to this chess piece was a very naughty little child. And that's why we see all of the porcelain children in this game act in a very naughty way. If you look at their behavior when left alone, these children are incredibly, incredibly naughty, just doing things that most naughty children would do. Now, when they are around the teacher, the teacher does not put up with this. In fact, even if they move just a little bit, she will slap her ruler down on the desk. She does not tolerate this stuff, but when the children are away from her, they are very, very, very naughty. Now, if we go back to this room, if you look at this room, there's a couple of hints here. There is a picture of the teacher with a number of darts thrown in it. There is a picture that has a mustache drawn on it. And then there is also a picture of a fox that appears to be doing some naughty business. Now, you can see these a few places around the school, but the idea here is that this little boy was a very naughty boy and the teacher didn't like that one bit. However, this kid also managed to get out of the teacher's way. He managed to escape and he escaped to one room. However, he got trapped here. The teacher who had been hunting him for a long time finally trapped him in here and checkmate. That's why he's tied to this chess piece and that's why he's dead. He starved to death tied to this chess piece. Again, look at the eyes. They're the only time you ever see a child with their eyes closed. Now, further to this, when you unlock the door, there is incredibly, incredibly poignant and sad music that plays. And at first I didn't really get it, but if you think about all of that, this music makes so much sense. This little boy's fate was finally, he got caught by the children and the teacher and it was game over for him. It was checkmate. So what I think was going on here was that this school originally had human occupants. Over time, the porcelain children and this monstrous teacher started to take over. Maybe the teacher warped into this monster or maybe the porcelain children, there was only one or two of them and more and more were added as time went on and the school became more and more nightmarish as time went on and the normal human children decided to try and escape. Now, the reason I think this is because if you actually see in the first island and in further parts of the game, you will actually see there seems to be a number of children that have somehow escaped this place and have seemingly died. At the first part of the game on the island, you can see that the hunter has caught this kid and he has also seemingly starved to death in this cage. Again, another human child that we've seen die. I think this human child escaped probably with Six and managed to make it to this island before both of them were caught by the hunter. Whereas Six was brought to the house and for some reason this boy was caught in a trap. I don't know, but either way, multiple children seem to have escaped to this island and maybe this is why Six seemingly tries to then go back through the school because she knows there is no escape this way. She failed once before and now yet again, she's now using Mono to try and escape, but this time she's a little bit more clever about it. Now, another bonus theory about the school. I do think that even before this place succumbed to whatever happened with this world, I do think that they were teaching children that if they're naughty, bad things will happen to them. If you look in the attic, you can see that this one porcelain child has a dunce's hat on his head. Now, dunce's hat was something that were used in the, the real world a long time ago. But if you look a little bit more closely, this isn't a dunce's hat. 
this is a gnome's head. And in the next room, you can see a bunch of them. They are very, very clearly the same shape and the same pattern as a gnome head. I think that either this teacher or even maybe the previous teachers were teaching the children that if you're naughty, you'll be turned into gnomes, much like we found out in the Residence DLC of the first game. Maybe it's just a callback to the first game, maybe it's just a little Easter egg, but I do think that there is definitely merit here to this theory that people in this world absolutely know that it is possible for children to be turned into gnomes and that their teachers were trying to teach the children not to be naughty because if they were, the same fate might befall them. So that's my theory. This once used to be a normal school that has been warped or twisted into a nightmarish version. The once occupants of this school have fled. Some of them have died. Some of them got caught in their escape attempt and others managed to escape only to get caught by some other nightmare along the way. Let me know what you think about this theory down in the comments below. Do you think I'm right? Do you think I'm wrong? Either way, I want to hear your thoughts and I hope you have enjoyed this little Nightmares 2 theory video. If, if you want to see more content like this, let me know by liking the video, maybe subscribing, and I will see you next time.